Hello, I'm Rodolfo Ragonesi and welcome to another episode of Geopolitica. With me I have uh, Jason Giardina and today we are going to be talking about an interesting subject, a very important subject, which is security in Europe. So, it doesn't need much introduction as to hmm. what's been happening, at least we know there's a lot of... Uh, major problems with the conflict going on in the Ukraine, Jason. But sadly enough, apart from the tragedy, of course, of, of conflicts which affect people on a national level, economic level, and more tragically on, on a human level, which is very, very tragic, whoever is involved. There's another major problem, which is also tragic in its own way, that there is no objective reporting of uh, the crisis and the conflict in Ukraine. The journalism, unfortunately, is not what it used to be. And you hear one side of the story. Yep. So we're not here to try to give another side of the story. I mean, both sides, it's up to them to give their side of the story. But we, I think it's, it's important that we share with uh, people following us, with our listeners and followers, um, different aspects that might not necessarily be covered by the Western media. I think this is an important, an important issue. Maybe to give some insight as to how it affects us locally as well. How yes. it has affected, affected well, us locally. locally in Malta, right? yes. We also have an audience outside Malta mm -hmm. <laughs> as, as we start uh, <laughs> to generate a bit more interest. Viva the internet. <laughs> but uh, certainly in the Maltese islands, yes, which are constitutionally uh, neutral, at least on paper, on paper, it seems to be a bit of a dead on letter paper. because uh, as the lines are drawn in conflict, uh, neutrality seems to become uh, something of the past, which again is, is a very serious issue because according to our constitution, our Maltese islands That's right. um, ought to remain neutral. But um, what I would like to do before going into some, some basic pointers is refer our, our audience to a lecture that was given last year by Professor John Mearsheimer, who is a professor at the University of Chicago. And he has given a lecture on the background of the crisis in Ukraine. I suggest that people follow this. Uh, we're posting a link up um, over here on, on, on the program so people can look at that. We are talking about a professor who has a good reputation, who's done his research, and if you please, it was given this uh, lecture under the auspices of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies. So these are no, uh, this is not some Russian faction trying to spew uh, one version <coughs> or propaganda. This is from a university professor of Chicago under the auspices of the Robert Schumann Center um, for Advanced Studies. But I think. Um, to mention some pointers here by way of introduction. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that the conflict started last year. That's right. And in fact, the conflict is almost 10 years old. More? Nine years. Well, 2014, even before that. Even but before let's say that. it started in earnest in 2014. Right. Um, because basically we had a form of civil war in the Ukraine, right? You had the West, the Ukrainian ethnic Ukrainians right. who had a new government um, that uh, gained power in, uh, let's say, a very unconventional manner because the constitutionality of the new government was called into question very seriously. Right. I mean, my background is constitutional law. As part of it, it's, uh, my thesis was done on, on international constitutional law on the part of the president. So I know a thing or two about constitutionality of, of, of governance. And a lot was called into question. But let's not go into that because it's not the subject matter of today. The point is, in 2014, there was a conflict, an internal conflict. And the eastern Ukraine, um, made up largely of Russian people, ethnic Russians, who spoke Russian as their first right. language and identified with the, with the Russian culture, but they were part of the Ukrainian population, just as we have 100,000 foreigners, foreigners in Malta, right. for example. I mean, do we give them rights um, not equal to our own? If we did, we would be breaking our own constitutional cool. laws. So unfortunately, they felt um, uh, 
uh, a grievance that they were not being treated equally. We're not going to go into details because it would take hours of, uh, of um, discussion. But they wanted more autonomy. And as a result of the conflict there, in 2014, um, the major powers got together and they came up with the Minsk agreements. They were undertaking international undertakings that were being, um, if you wish, guaranteed by both sides, by Russia, by by European Union, by France and Germany, um, and so on, in order to guarantee um, the way forward through the Minsk agreements. And one of the things that the Minsk agreements did actually mention is more autonomy to eastern Ukraine. And unfortunately, this was never done. So the civil war has continued for over eight years. Mm. This is the background. So it's not a question of taking sides. I mean, my side is the side of peace, mm -hmm. always. When conflicts break out, the only interest I would think we should all have is peace. And my principle is, if we don't fight for peace, we will have war. It's as simple as that. But people don't say this. People quote um, the, the author of the, the Art of War, and they say, if you want peace, you have to prepare for war. That is something that's been quoted through the centuries. If you want peace, you have to prepare for war. But what they don't tell you is, if you don't fight for peace, you will have war. And I think that is a principle we need to keep in mind. So, I would say, following the Minsk agreements, following a change in government in the United States, a lot of arms from in, nine, in 2021 started moving into the Ukraine. Let me just um, stop you for a second, Rudolf, because there was an interesting um, footnote to the Minsk agreement, and that was that Chairman, oh, uh, Chancellor, former Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel, went on media and actually stated that the Minsk agreement was done um, in order to provide Ukraine time to, to make military preparations because they knew that uh, eventually Ukraine would go to war with Russia. And the Minsk agreement, even though it was never signed, naively so, unfortunately, for the side of, of Russia, uh, that it was done in order to provide Ukraine time to prepare. Angela Merkel has, has stated as such on, in German media. It's, reports have been uh, circulating in the last couple of weeks. I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Well, again, you go back to the, to the um, principle, are you, are you fighting for peace or are you not fighting for exactly. peace? If you're preparing for war, because you said you use the word prepare, prepare for what? <laughs> <laughs> if you're preparing for confrontation, for con then yeah. you're going to get confrontation. You're going to get conflict. If you're fighting for peace, then you're going to try to implement the, the Minsk wars and not use them as uh, delaying tactics to do something else, right. to push another agenda. So, I mean, essentially, I think it's in the interest of all European citizens. So that means citizens, European Union, Ukraine, Russia, they're all part of Europe geographically. That's right. We are all part of the same region of Europe, all of us. We are all fellow Europeans. And whatever happens in any part of that region affects all of us. Well, it's not just that. If you look at the history of wars, they've happened all over the world, but the, the number of wars and major wars that have happened in Europe is horrendous. So much destruction and strife and misery has happened throughout Europe. We mentioned um, Robert Schumann, uh, the, the, at least the, the, the Center for Advanced Studies. It's named after Robert Schumann, who was a foreign minister who was one of the founders of the principles of, um, of a European integration, essentially. He was behind the uh, European Coal and Steel Community in 1952, which was a precursor to the European uh, Community and then the European, what we know now as the European Union. And one of the reasons that Robert Schuman and others, and Adenauer and uh, uh, Gaspari and a couple of others, were pushing was to have peace and security in Europe. Mm. Why? Because they saw after World War One, World War Two, and hundreds of years of conflict that it was destroying Europe. Is this what we want again? So when we talk about, you know, sending tanks, arming Ukraine, arming Ukraine, why are we arming Ukraine rather than seeking peace? It's not a question of taking one side or another. Mm. We should be on the side of peace and not on the side of demonizing one side 
and pushing for for and because there is always going to be a hidden agenda. Nothing happens for no that's reason. That's right. No? And you know, sending sending tanks and, and armaments and so forth. That is what most people see as war, but it's not the only aspect of war. For example, when we partake in uh, sanctions, that is, is in and of itself an act of war. Definitely. Because Sun Tzu, if anyone has ever read The Art of War, Sun Tzu tells you that if you want to destroy your enemy, you don't do it by putting soldiers on the ground. That's the last resort that you go to. You do so by um, re eliminating your opponent's resources. So exactly. sanctions are just that. You are you are forcing your, your opponent to rely on yes. limited resources, which dwindles their, yes. their ability to, and in to fact, oppose you. In fact, the United Nations Charter makes it very clear that economic sanctions that are not endorsed and supported by the United Nations are against international law. That's right. And this is something the world has forgotten. And all our journalists in the world, unfortunately, media has become very largely compromised, very largely captured, very largely controlled. They're not mentioning this. Why are they not quoting international law? When international law is telling you that economic sanctions that are not endorsed by the United Nations are illegal. That's right. And yet they don't tell you anything. Uh, why don't they cover the fact that, for example, US forces are physically present in Syria. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Does that, does, so what is the difference between, you might think it's, it's, it's a naive question, what is essentially the difference between American forces in Syria and Russian forces in Ukraine? That's yes, right. Of course there are a lot of differences, but if we're going to look at legal principles here, what is right, what is wrong, who has a right to, to, to um, have a presence in another country, mm -hmm. and on what basis? And we have to, we have to remember as well that um, during the Minsk agreements, there was a, 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 a famously quoted um, part of the agreement which said that NATO would not move one inch east. That was not the Minsk agreement. Sorry, in, that's going back to, to yes. So my apologies. Yes, that's right. That's going back to the um, the summit between Gorbachev, uh, George Bush, that's right, senior and Gorbachev. And so, no one asks the question. Could you imagine if, for example, China put military bases up on the border of Mexico? What would how would the U.S. retaliate? Obviously, I think most Americans would agree that they would have a right to. To bear arms and, and and to you know repel that that type of establishment of a military base on well, the border look of Mexico. What happened in Cuba, nineteen sixty two, exactly the mil the Cuban Missile Crisis, exact same situation. Yes. We had, uh, and unfortunately, it was not completely unprovoked. Again, this is not to take the side of the Cubans, absolutely not the side of Fidel Castro. And I would have been the first to say, absolutely, do not have. Russian missiles in Cuba because that would constitute um, a crisis of security. Absolutely would agree. But you can't say that that Cuba was completely unprovoked because before the Fidel Castro regime, you had the Batista regime. People think that the government before Cuba was, was some democratic government where everything was all hunky-dory. No. Mm -hmm. there, was, there was General Batista who was a dictator and, and the mafia flourished under under Batista's That's regime. Right. And when the, the, the Castro regime took over, they they kicked out the mafia. But a lot of that mafia had strong links with the with the United States. It was American mafia, mm -hmm. American even Italian mafia, but you know, Italian American mafia, let's say including um, La Luciano, La who Cruciano. was thrown out of, of the United States in I believe 1945, 1946, after seemingly uh, helping and assisting the Americans in, in, in the conflict in Italy. And the condition was, we will let you out of prison, um, but you have to leave the United States. And uh, the first port of call was Cuba, and he <laughs> set up uh, his... He didn't his, go far. <laughs> yes. And of course, what did he do? He, he just basically set up all the, the mafia. That's right. The mafia in Cuba. So, you know, nothing, is, no conflict is unprovoked. And mm -hmm. if, if the Russians were given these guarantees by the West that um, missiles would not be moved to in, um, close to Russia's border, and the, the, the countries that were seen as a buffer between West and East would not 
be taken into NATO. And they reneged on that. That creates a security problem Absolutely. for Russia. Absolutely. So it's not a question of wanting to side with one country or another. Mm -hmm. This is what we call real politique. It's, it's real politique. It's, it's exactly what it is. It's the reality of the world. Who wants... I am a multi-citizen. Do I want to have NATO missiles on the Russian border? Of course I wouldn't want, because I see that as a European threat. That's right. Not necessarily just a Russian threat. A European threat, because it will spill over onto Europe. Mm -hmm. So why are we being pushed to have NATO countries pushing onto on the Russian, Russian border. border and Ukraine getting into NATO. Mm -hmm. Why should Ukraine not remain neutral? This is in Europe's interest for NATO Absolutely. to remain neutral and not for NATO to become part of of, uh, of NATO and to have its missiles, what, in the Donbass, which is populated by Russian people. So they would be using the people of Donbass, Russian people, as a form of, of a human shield around mm -hmm. their own missiles. Mm -hmm. So in the case of a missile exchange, You've got the Russians on the Russian side of the border and the Russians on the Ukrainian side of the border being the victims mm -hmm. of a missile exchange. That's right. Come on. And, that's, and that is security in Europe. So we're, we're all happy. Some of our leaders are happy to demonize the other side and pretend that, that, that the faults lie with the other side. It's Zelensky good, Putin bad. When really... Well, and, and you know, Zelensky, with all due respect, it's an authoritarian regime. Absolutely. I mean, the people think that he is the the embodiment of democracy. Well, They've banned, he's banned political opposition parties. Imagine what would happen if we were to do that here, if we were to do that in another European and, country. Why is no one speaking out against the fact that a lot of political parties have been banned? Why is no one speaking out against the fact that that journalism, free media, has now been um, suppressed? In and the Ukrainians had an elect a democratically elected president that, that was deposed. Is that correct? Well, as we started uh, by saying this, yes, it was very, very questionable how, they, mm. uh, how there was a change in the regime from mm. a constitutional basis. It's highly, highly questionable. Yes, yes. But, uh, and we haven't even spoken about the, um, uh, the bio labs. That's right. That have been found That's in right. Ukraine. Yeah. I mean, this is a huge, huge threat issue. to all of Europe, Absolutely. to the whole world. Why, why should we have bio labs in Ukraine? You know? Ukraine has a lot of corruption problems, a lot you, of bio It's interesting you, put, in you said that because it's Ukraine... a huge issue. Ukraine used to be considered one of the most corrupt countries in the world. In fact, we, in the banking system, uh, banks weren't allowed to, to be sending monies over into the Ukraine. But now all of a sudden it seems that it's okay to be sending billions over in terms of funds and armaments. Uh, so, yes, so in fact, it, until the recent past, we had a, comp, uh, a country that had a horrific record regarding corruption, which has bio labs. We've all seen what ha could possibly happen with an outbreak mm -hmm. of a disease in, in, in recent years. We have the problem that they're closing down political uh, par opposition parties, that they're closing down and coming down on the media. And yet Zelensky does a world tour, if you please, and is invited to speak at all these various parliaments in the world. And not only is he allowed to speak, but the moment he sets foot into Parliament, he gets a standing ovation. <laughs> Amazing. So, so this is a leader of a very corrupt country, which is bankrupt, which has all these problems that we've just mentioned, and he gets a standing ovation from those persons we have put into our respective parliaments. And associating itself. Why are they giving them, giving him standing ovation? And associating itself with Nazi, fa with Nazi factions. Like the Azov Regiment. Yes, sir. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, there's a rise of fascism in the West. There's a rise of fascism in Ukraine. Let's not beat around the bush. No. Because fascism is rising. And this is a major, major threat, a major problem. There are many other problems that, are, that we are facing. And yet, instead of looking at these problems, instead of having our own leaders see what shortcomings our countries um, are responsible for and trying to clean up our act. We're demonizing another side and we're getting closer and closer to a global. And country. we're creating these cartoonish juvenile narratives, you know, where we, we, we look at it as though it's one superhero defending the world against this evil villain. You know, I, I mean, these type of narratives, we really need to, to, to seize them. It's childish. It's childish. Yes, and unfortunately, if, if, if we we become uh, we get sus susceptible to to naivety, we become naive. Mm -hmm. 
or remain naive, and we don't open our eyes to real politic. So now, going forward, what about the situation in terms of, um, we obviously know about the, the, um, the pipeline which was destroyed, how it was destroyed, who destroyed it is another question. But in terms of now um, gas for Europe, because what we're seeing now is the contracts which will be expiring in this year. Not Luckily, we've had a relatively mild winter throughout Europe, but next year they are, they are saying that we sh uh, will be facing some very dire situations because the oil contracts for right, this year right. will be expiring. And then the next year, yes, yes. because of the, the shortage of supply, uh, Europe will be facing a gas shortage. What do you think about that type of situation? Have you, have you given any thought to that? Well, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, is are we, have we been shooting ourselves in the foot? Too? Mm -hmm. it's, it's been a great doubt in my mind whether Europe is really conducting its own independent foreign policy at all. Or no, I agree. It's become a puppet um, in, in, in the hands either of US policy or I would go beyond that of policy which is being dictated by by a group of very, very powerful internationalists and powerful globalists who are influencing and dictating policy in both the United States and Europe. Because it certainly isn't in Europe's best interest, it's to, not in our interest. To, be, to be sanctioning Russia, which is you know, one of the biggest suppliers of natural gas. The whole idea of Europe was to be more integrated, mm -hmm. to have peace and prosperity. And that happens when you have more trade and not less trade. Mm -hmm. Um, and there is an exchange of people, an exchange of services, an exchange of goods, and this is not happening. And I don't think people again tend to say, "Oh, well, this is a conflict which is, which is demonizing Russia, it's targeting Russia, etc." It goes way beyond that. It's way beyond that. It for goes sure. way beyond that because the global agendas have existed for thousands of years, and it's naive to think that suddenly global agendas don't exist. Mm. This is not a question of conspiracy theories. There no, have no, always been international agendas and empire making. And I think the Western hegemony is being challenged by the, the, the new countries, the developing countries. Well, the West is the, the bulwark of freedom, right? So if you attack the West... In theory, the West has been the bulwark of freedom, but unfortunately, it's also been the center of Ag imperialism yes. and neo-colonialism. Yeah. Because the rest of the world have, has had to suffer the effects of American-European colonialism. And it still takes the form of neo-colonialism because they're taking the resources of other countries um, and exploiting them in different ways. And, and that is being done even on a financial system. Because if you look at the, the, the World Bank, the, um, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements, these are extremely powerful bodies mm -hmm. and the central banks, the key central banks in the West. They're very, very influential and they dictate financial policies on a global level. But who is controlling them? The West. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the world is not happy with that because they say, listen, you've been dictating to us financially, economically, militarily, politically, politically for so long, we don't want this. And now there are new alliances forming in the world, like the BRICS nations, yeah, cool. um, Britain, Russia, sorry, uh, Brazil, Russia, China. India, China, and South Africa. You also have Mexico knocking on their door, mm -hmm. Egypt knocking on their door, Saudi Arabia saying they're also going to be looking at joining the BRICS nations. So when you start attacking one of the BRICS nations, you are attacking them all mm -hmm. because you are attacking what the BRICS nations stand for. And this is something that people need to understand and keep in, in mind because it's like a grand chess game. If you're knocking off a piece on the, on the chessboard, it's because you're trying to get position. A, a, a better position to defeat cool. the enemy, which is not that piece. Russia is just a piece on the chessboard, mm -hmm. but the BRICS nations are basically the other side. At this there stage. definitely seems to be a global shift in the, in the um, dynamic in terms of currencies, in terms of, um, like we're talking about these BRICS nations now wanting to go on to a different currency in, ter in order to um, trade natural gas and oil. Um, and I wanted to also speak to you, Rudolf, about the local situation in terms of, um, for example, we had the U.S. naval ship here docked in, in the Maltese docks just a few days ago. 
apparently against um, Maltese constitutional law. Maybe you can provide your, your uh, opinion on that. And also about uh, members of uh, Maltese government in the UN making statements uh, seemingly contradictory to uh, Maltese neutrality. Maybe you can, you can address that. Well, I think neutrality is becoming uh, a dead letter, unfortunately. Um, they're bound by neutrality legally, but then politically that they're, they're acting generally differently. I think this is, this is becoming a reality. In terms of um, ships uh, coming into, into port, again, either you're going to keep an equidistance between the two powers, so mm. either you allow both sides None. Or you, you allow neither, because if you're allowing one and not the other, then obviously you're not equidistant and you're not neutral. Mm. And um, there were a couple of Russian ships that were not allowed into port um, about a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. I remember I think that. under the previous government. That's right, yes. So, so that, that begs one question. The second thing is that generally, if a, if, um, a ship is nuclear powered, it's considered to be a ship which is not to be allowed into Maltese ports because it's nuclear powered and so on. Um, because this was also another issue. But mm. the problem is that it's like uh, our, our government turns a bit of a blind eye because rather than doing its own homework to find out if that ship is nuclear powered, it's quite easy to find out in this day and age. Um, it, uh, it would ask the country of that ship. Is it nuclear power? Mm -hmm. And then there is this policy to neither state uh, either way, n neither to confirm or deny. And on that basis, it's as though, well, we're not giving you information. Okay, so we don't know if it's nuclear powered, we'll allow you into the into port, which of course, it's playing around. Mm -hmm. Because as I said, our government would know whether if it does its research, whether a, a ship is nuclear powered, and it would say, listen, on the basis of this, we will not allow you into port. And do you think these actions like, you know, these actions where we allow these ships into port, where we refuse ships of other uh, um, opposing factions into port, where we have politicians at the U UN uh, Security Council making such statements, do you think that these type of actions put Malta in a perilous situation in this regard? in terms of the conflict with, with, uh, with, with Russia and, and Ukraine? Well, I think we're all at risk because, you know, I mean, there's no such thing as a localized war anymore. Mm. So, especially, certainly in terms of missile exchanges, certainly in terms of economic um, woes and problems, it affects everyone mm. in, in, in a global way. But of course, Malta is an extremely small country. It's, it's far more dependent economically um, than larger countries. And therefore, we're more vulnerable. Let's put it this way. So, it's more, even more reason for us to, to, to be as neutral as possible and actually to act as peacemakers, if anything. Well, you know, I would have preferred to see Malta re retain its, its neutrality and say, listen, we will offer Malta as a venue like we did with Gorbachev um, and, and, and Bush so Senior and say, listen, use Malta as a venue to meet and to try to... to, to to formulate a way forward. So philosophically speaking, sides. you still agree with, with Maltese neutrality. You don't think that that is... Uh... I think neutrality is the best um, uh, policy for mm. us. So mm. obviously it is entrenched in our constitution. Mm. And when it was done, I was in full agreement. I, I think that it was a very, very good idea. Because there seems to be you know, um, a growing um, faction of the Maltese populace who think that Maltese neutrality is something that we should no longer um, maintain and that we should take sides one I way I think it's another. a great mistake. I mean, the I Swedes agree. are doing the same thing. So we want to join NATO now, you know? I mean, mm -hmm. Sweden was supposed to be retaining its neutrality for very specific reasons. Mm -hmm. And it felt that it was also good for, from a security point of view. So this whole idea, I think, is, 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 is crazy because we are only getting closer and closer to, to a global conflict and people just don't understand how bad it could be. Mm. I think we've it had a. Could, it will be worse than World War One and World War Two put together. It we've had a good for too long. Horrific. We've had a good for too long. Yes. Where we've had the a generation who of people remember who remember, who are still around. Are, well, they're not around. Most of them are not. Most around. are not, not around. You know? But those who are, are warning us, and we're not taking no, heed of that warning. We're not listening. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, we've covered quite a bit. Again, a very vast subject. We we need to organize another episode and and carry on another day. But I think we've covered a f quite a few interesting points. Mm -hmm. today, so.
I hope people keep asking questions. Always listen to two sides of every argument. Remember, like any court of law, if anyone's gone into any court case, a judge is supposed to hear both sides before he can decide. If he doesn't, then the judgment he gives is annulled. And we are deciding on the basis of one side of the story. And that is crazy. You know, and we need to know what's happening because it's in our interests. European security is of utmost importance. And we are crazy. We're going to keep beating these drums. And I would just repeat what I've said earlier. If we do not fight for peace. We will have war. And that would be crazy. Thank you very much for following us. Looking forward to seeing you again on our next episode. Bye -bye.